Good morning, let me invite you on Young Scientist session, the session devoted to environmental and ecological issues. Uh, I see that at least uh, three of presenters are already in the room, so let me start the session. Uh, we have planned four presentation. The first presenter will be Patrick Katmarek, which uh, refer us the issue related to climate change and regional policy interactions and determinants in the Wielkopolska region. So Patrick, if you can share your presentation and floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and present some of the results of research I'm uh, carrying out in connection with the preparation of my uh, doctoral thesis. Today, I would like to talk about two important element of, elements of my research, the theoretical model of impact of climate change in socioeconomic development and a special classification due to the vulnerability to climate change. The presentation aims to present and empirically verify the theoretical and conceptual model that organize the existing body of knowledge of socioeconomic development, climate change, and its effect on spatial differ differentiation of development and the orientation of regional policy towards to adaptation and mitigation. My empirical verif verification of the model took place using quantitative methods. The study was carried out of area of the Kopolska region and the data used of uh, used concert that year 2019. Uh, some words about uh, theoretical background of my research. Uh, an important point I would like to emphasize regarding the effects of climate change is that it is already to be assumed that the negative, but also positive. Of course, occurring in a limited way. Effects of climate change are leading to widening divergence in development. The pressure of climate change can be attempted to be considered in system of two spheres, the environmental sphere and socioeconomic sphere. Adverse effects in the environmental sphere focus on changes in access or destruction of natural resources uh, which they are linked to increase uh, in temperature reduction in drinking water supplies or rising sea levels. The literature review conduct so far does not suggest any examples of beneficial effect of climate change and environmental sphere. However, it should be borne in mind that such perceptions are highly individual depending on the specific situation, location and linkages. This is an example of uh, systematic, systematization of development factors and sub-factors that I have used to organize knowledge about the impact of climate change on spatial distribution of development. We see uh, factors like human capital, social capital, material capital, financial capital, and of course, innovation. Uh, here is an exemplar impact on development factors, factors of human capital. We see a problem, this impact on population situation like environmental refugees, migration, mobility, for example, changing mobility of seasonal workers, uh, state of the labor market. We see here a poverty risk to this working in agriculture. It's of course, climate change has been influencing development policy for many decades. We know the uh, report of UTANT, uh, Book of Limits of the Growth, Protocol Montreal, Toronto Conference, Rio de Janeiro, of course, European Green New Deal. Two approaches are now most commonly advocated, sustainable development and the growth. The interaction of climate policy with other policies are unavailable. Therefore, climate policy should be taken into account as part of development and targeting policy framework within the personal activities of sectoral policies. The climate policy integration approach advocated in literature adopts the principle that environment on climate change is only one of the set values to be considered in a more coordinated or rational approach, approach to policymaking. 
Of course, there is potential, potential for in the integrating public intervention resources, targeting the implementation of climate change adaptation activities by investing them in existing and ongoing projects as well as projects yet to be planned. Unfortunately, oh, sorry. Unfortunately, regional policy aimed at mitigation that effects of the climate crisis is currently taking an exposed approach based on responsive actions. The main reason for this is the limited public awareness of climate change and its consequences. Attention has been drawn to the fact that each region shares responsibility for climate change, but not everyone will be negatively affected, and some may even gain. By exploiting the few positive effects of these changes, or by taking advantage of social economic deterioration in other regions. Climate change is, of course, a global process, but more and more people are recognizing its consequences regionally and locally. Therefore, uh, the appropriate development policy response to climate change appears to be regional policy, which allows for design of intervention that respect regional and local biodiversity and local uh, and, and regional and local climatic conditions. Bottom up, bottom up actions typically in programming and implementation of regional policies seem more effective because they can be carried uh, carried out in direct connection with environmental objectives adopted in each region. At this point, it is uh, important to emphasize the regional policy response to climate change should not only focus on reducing the negative effects of climate change, but also on promoting economic change. So, Challenges related to impact of climate change on the targeting of regional policies, short summary. We can see identif identify the relevance of the climate crisis in the programming and implementation of development policy, including regional policy by regional and local government authorities. We have a very problem with pure, pure measurability of regional policies in the context of climate change mitigation and adaptation. And of course, we need creating the conditions for strengthening policy support for climate policy. Uh, on base of this theoretical background, I try to propose a theoretical model of the impact of climate change in social economic development and development policy, including uh, regional policy. So I try explain my model step by step uh, on the basis of the liter literature is formulated this theoretical and conceptual model so the first step we can accept scientific consensus is that humans and their activities social behavior pollution predatory use of resources it's e and the minority extend natural environmental process like volcanic activity changes in the tilt of earth, earth axis, etc., uh, have a significant impact on the climate. Adopting associations of IPC framework convention, climate change results from a perturbation of the properties of an earth climate system, which in turn translates uh, into changes in that system and the emergence of climate changes, climate change effects. The effects of climate change have the power effect on changing socioeconomic development factors directly or indirectly and changing uh, focus of development policy interventions. And this uh, indirectly uh, interventions again on the socioeconomic development factors that are shaped by this uh, by this intervention. Uh, as part of the development governance system, development policies implemented through the activities of sectoral or, or regional policies. 
the scope of which are broadening and changing environment to include climate change mitigation and adaptation. Changing development factors influence the socio-economic development of the region, which diversifies specially. This development may again result in the emergence of environmental negative human activities, of the closure of dependency model in question, until the economy reach a level of climate neutrality. Of course, I know my model uh, can be focus of both earth science and human geography. Uh, in my uh, doctoral research, I focus on the lower part of this model on human geography. And now I want to show some empirical verification of this model. <clears throat> so part of my uh, Try verification, empirical verification of the model is special classification of communist of the Kopolsky region by socioeconomic vulnerability to climate change. Uh, an element of this, this classification was carried uh, followed a uh, visible shame. I use uh, some methods like Pearson linear correlation, zero based unitization method. Uh, and of course, Helvig method. In the beginning, uh, future selection based on literature review, oh. selection of 24 territorial capital futures presenting uh, social economic vulnerability to climate change. Next, I try to description selecting characteristic using statistical indicators. And I compilation on some geographic base of observations. Next, I reduction to select statistically significant indicators and standardization of these values using uh, this zero basing utilization method and the end i construction and the synthetic indicator uh, the reduction of the matrix results in such of this set of 15 indicators which were standardized as i said uh, we can see uh, these indicators according to the uh, factors of regional development, uh, they are represented by indicators. So we can go to the result. Uh, classification based on mean and standardization deviation showed a special variation on socioeconomic vulnerability in climate change. We can see uh, 11 very high vulnerability municipalities. Uh, many municipalities are in medium vulnerability and only 16 very low vulnerability. They are in center of our region. And of course, this is uh, agglomeration of Poznań agglomeration. The result obtained apart from information on where the areas most vulnerable to climate change are in the Kopolski Vivotship in socioeconomic terms showed uh, the existence of peripheral areas. The result obtained is in this way is identical of another literature examples like in Pakistan, Makalar, uh, in, sorry, in India, in Makalar. In, maybe some conclusions climate change has become for i think become important factor influencing development policy including regional development policy there is a need for further research into effects of climate change and in, in its impact on social economic development and regional and local level as these levels are best placed to pursue effective climate policies uh, I think my verification of this model confused the climate change affects everyone, but impacts in Evely. There are areas that are particularly socioeconomic vulnerable to climate change. And I think it seems important to deter to state of knowledge of climate policies implemented in areas particularly vulnerable to climate change. Thank you for your attention. Let me invite the Agnieszka Pilarska to present the issue 
related to environmental pollution and the health condition of the population of Polish towns. Uh, the title of my presentation has been mentioned, uh, mentioned at the beginning, so I will, will just go uh, further. Uh, to a study of uh, uh, very much of my concept, uh, the general thinking about the in some kind of influence of the environmental pollution on the, uh, on the health of the population, it doesn't matter if it is the, uh, the um, it doesn't matter if it is the <clears throat> health status of the population or individuals. We have to remember uh, this uh, paradigm of the health field concept created by Mark Lalonde in 1974. Uh, he, it's, still, it's still on the top, it's still going on this concept. And I mention it because uh, when we think about this concept, it says, it's said that uh, about 60% of the influence of our health status has got our lifestyle. And on the second part, some kind of genes and biology, and only mm, about 20%, 15 to, uh, base to uh, 20% is only the environmental factors. So here we have to think that it's only 20% maximum, 20% of environmental factor, factor of the health status but we have to say that it's um, in this uh, health field concept by Lalonde it's taking into account everything so not only the natural environment but also the but also the uh, social economical environment so here it's very hard to make uh, the um, uh, research on the influence mm, so that every kind of, of finding strong correlations, for example, by the statistic method like the Pearson, uh, Pearson correlation coefficients, will be not as, uh, will be not satisfying. So in my research, because I'm uh, deeply uh, deeply connected with my research with medical geography, uh, I for my purposes of the research, I use the coincidence phenomena or co-occurrence phenomena. So uh, only at the beginning, yeah, it should be uh, mentioned. Uh, so uh, the source of the statistical data, just giving into the shorts, uh, a call, of course, the data comment, uh, came from the local data bank of the central statistic office. But what here I put, what type of the data? When I think about in my presentation of this research and particularly of this research about the <clears throat> about the diseases, what kind of health status, uh, uh, it's a uh, 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 crude mortality rate, which rate which I calculated from the data available on the uh, Central Statistical Office. So it is disease of circulatory system, no plus, and diseases of the rep respiratory uh, system. So those three are um, generally in the global population, not only in Poland. Those three major uh, diseases are the major health. Uh, uh, problems according to the mortality. So that's why they have been choosed. Um, and in this, for the purposes of this presentation and this research, what I and in what I took, the how, uh, environmental pollution, so the emissions gen generally connected with the industry, very heavy industry, oppressive industry and uh, oppressive facilities. So the um, gases, uh, pollutants and dust pollutants and the uh, loads of pollutants in sewage discharge into waters or into the ground. Unfortunately, it was here to, uh, according to the data, I wasn't able to uh, difference or it is the water contamination or the ground contamination. So I will talk here together with the, with the environmental pollution together. Uh, and uh, here I've made uh, two main uh, profiles, time profiles, so multi-year periods of at the beginning of my research and at the end. Why this uh, beginning 2007? Because uh, before it was the change of the method methodology in collecting the data in the uh, Central Statistical Office for this data, so it wasn't, wouldn't be comparable. Um, 
and uh, unfortunately i wasn't also able to do it for the all uh towns with the powiat rights in poland because only for the 42 of them have been available data for the um, nitrogen and uh, phosphorus in total pollutions uh, taken yes so uh, unfortunately those are the limitations of the data uh, so of so the cartographic data but let's take to into account the methods yeah so it's in the order so uh, like i said before it's very hard to uh, analyze the influence or talk about the influence of the environment natural environment on the health status so we have to in the light of the concept of the health fields of the lalons talk about the occurrence or co coincidence so that's i i uh, choose those methods so for example uh, at the beginning we will uh, i will sh show the results multi-dimensional scaling uh, Proxcal. So, for just copying, just just to show what are the patterns of the dissimilarity and similarity between the this uh, 24, uh, 44, 42, sorry, 42 uh, select, uh, re, uh, selected cities, then we will be going deep into details. What is the spatial coincidence, spatial co occurrence? thanks to the method of, of the principal component an analysis given by the Varimax rotation, what I choose. Uh, Kamin's cl uh, clustering because of the showing what are the group's main main cities that have got this uh, strong co coincident, but strong coincident, I mean here, the groups of the high uh, risk are appearing in, in the cities and some of the results of the principal component and i'll show it on the map so go to the results so uh multi-dimensional scaling results in the shorts here we have got the results for two profiles time uh, time profiles and we have got here the projection of the two-dimensional common space for two those times the points here on the chart on the graph are the cities those 42 cities and a very interesting pattern we see here according to the similarity and dissimilarity, the similarity between the city, between the towns on the rights of the Powiats. So on the first uh, uh, time, period of the time, there are some of the groups of the cities of the towns in, in Poland uh, from taken from those 40, 42 that has got some kind of a similarity connected with the diseases yes because at the beginning we analyzed the, those three diseases that i have been talking about at the beginning but then suddenly uh, not suddenly but then in the uh more in the noah days those similar we haven't got that strong similarities we are having more more and more dissimilarities between the according to the crude mortality rates so let's see what happens according to these patterns in the environmental pollution. Just one more time, we, we are uh, analyzing the patterns of the, of the towns. So from the start to the beginning, in the two, uh, to do uh, those two analyzed periods, there are some groups that have got strong similarity and some groups that have got strong dissimilarity. So here in the first look, and uh, also I, I have to uh, just comment the stress, uh, so the uh, fit measures, those models uh, according to the first one are acceptable, acceptable and, and good. The second that is a little bit worse, but still acceptable, this uh, fit measures. But uh, those, let's see this, this few patterns, yes? So there will be, on this first look on the multi-dimensional uh, multi scaling, we look, we just look that it will be, it is very hard to, to because both of the data are going in the uh, different directions. But here it's very interesting thing, thing to, to consider further. Now we are going to, we are putting everything together. So all our 
those statistics that I have mentioned at the beginning, uh, we put together in the PCA analysis. So uh, here in the, for the uh, Kaiser uh, Mayer Olkin measure and sampling adequacy, we see that it's acceptable for those uh, analyzed. But unfortunate, but very also interesting. It's getting stronger further. So starting for the very uh, at the low of the below five uh, zero point five uh, five hundred nine to uh, zero point five. Uh, 49, so it's getting stronger, this um, this sampling adequacy. But here in the those case, uh, we also see that unfortunately we have to ex, uh, extract uh, from this all, uh, all uh, seven components or so seven variables was worth, worth taking into account the three components. So uh, both in the first period and so at the beginning and on the end of a period. But what is also very interesting here, we have very, uh, very uh, satisfaction, uh, let's say, uh, uh, explained variation in total. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, um, about between 78 in the second period and 79 uh, almost 80% in the in the uh, first period of the time but what are the what are these components so the uh, on the we see because i use the varimax rotation because a varimax rotation in the principal component analysis make it more clear that the variables are more divided between the components so the borders are sharper between the components. So let's see the results of the rotated component matrix by the very very max uh, rotation. And here the first one w uh, w uh, one and k o those are diseases. So first, uh, in two thousand seven two thousand nine, three uh, the first component is represented by the by the diseases. The second component is represented by the air pollutions, and the third component is represented by the by the um, by the <clears throat> sorry uh, by the soil and water pollutants. And second, here we have very interesting uh, thing, which we also we see on the graph that uh, it's very hard in the second period of analysis to um, extra, um, extract the principal component that it is defined by the diseases. Mostly, it's defined by the environmental pollution and the uh, rep uh, the diseases connected with the rep repository repository uh, system. Uh, so, how some kind of for example, problems with the, our lang lengths, etc. It's on the third component. It's on the third uh, on the third uh, component. The second component, those are the neoplans and the uh, security system diseases. And the first component in 2018 to 2020, it's all the pollutants. So. And also here we see the graph of the components in rotated solution. Here also we see very interesting thing that, as we can see that in the first period of the time, mostly of the diseases are not so, let's say, in the very strong connection between the coincidence with between the pollutants. But in the second period of the time, we see that the especially neopals and the security systems are getting in the coordinates of the first component closer and closer to, closer to the pollutants. So here also we see some kind of a pattern, which is one more time, I have to uh, also say that, that those connections, those uh, occurrence is very hard to, uh, to measure because of the uh, health uh, concept by, made by Lalonde, only 20% of the influence. But still we see that on the, we see that on the statistic results. That's why also those are so weak connections also. But here, I have to say that's very uh, only brief to see us uh, possibility of using 
if we had got, of course, if we had got the whole Poland, yes, for example, the possibility of using also cartographical methods, like for example, bivariate Hopit map. And here uh, we uh, so the relations. It is the realization. Those are the results of the principal component results. Uh, so the components put it together on one map. Put it together on one map. Uh, so relates diseases, air pollution, and see here. Very interesting. Uh, not only the Silesia region, but also Pomerania region. Very interesting phase. I think is going on here in the first period of the time with the coincidence of the occurrence of those of those two problems, phenomena connected with health and the the pollution, environmental pollution. This the next. Because it is the first component with the with the third components, also uh, especially changes on the uh, north and the Wielkopolska uh, region. Agnieszka had to going slowly to the conclusion. Okay, okay. So here I also choose it by the when we put together the second period, the distribution. So now the this is the conclusion. Oh, sorry. Uh, here I see that. Uh, sorry. Oh, I need that. Okay. So the cluster analysis, Kaimin's cluster on PC results. Unfortunately, here I highlighted, I highlighted the, <clears throat> let's see, the maximum of the uh, factor score component uh, made by the regression made method for each, uh, for each town. And unfortunately, so we have, uh, it would be too good to measure the dose combinations. So the third cluster B with the first cluster because the uh, factor score one it's diseases factor two uh, two number two it's um air pollution uh, three it's 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 water and soil and on the second period the first is pollution yes and those and the next are environment so unfortunately it's very hard to find these patterns but uh for example, when we analyze the strongest cluster, the first far, in the first period, in the first period, the strongest cluster of the uh, diseases, we can see the uh, connection with the uh, not the highest, but still in the plus connection with the third classes, with the third cluster. So here in Dombrowa Gurnicza, Dombrowa Gurnicza we see uh, some kind of pattern of con con occurrence which can be strong connected with the disease and uh, pollution the next one sosnowiec uh, sosnowiec uh, is also the is also the uh, example because here we have got we have got uh, the not the strongest but the mid strong uh, some kind of influence coincident with the water pollutant and with the ground pollutant. Uh, so in in and change and and change it all this one in the uh, in the second period. So only the last comment. We have three cities. So Wrocław, Płock, and one more time Dąbrowa Górnicza. And here the pattern is that the first third cluster is connected. So uh, environmental pollution. Yes. So here we have got environmental pollution at the first place in this equation. And here we have got the second cluster. So here we can say it's perfect, almost perfect, because here it's it's represented by the both diseases, circulatory and neoplasm. So Płoc has got this the strongest connections with the health and the and the environmental pollution. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and here also, uh, um, Agnieszka, last sentence. Okay, okay. So, and the, the last patterns, Płock and Dobrowa Górnicza, according mostly connected with the dose two diseases, not with the uh, last diseases, so with the repository uh, system. So, in taking into consideration, mostly we should in the Pol Poland uh, analyze the not only the secretary uh, systems connected with environmental pollution, but also uh, neoplan. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Agnieszka, uh, for your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any question to Agnieszka, 
please put uh, the question uh, in chat so we can uh, mm -hmm. i have uh, ended the sharing the the screen yeah 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 if you can stop sharing the screen uh, for this moment uh, i don't see any question in the chat uh, so uh, let me go to the third presentation if the question uh, will appear we come back to uh, agnieszka presentation okay thank you very much mm -hmm. Thank you, and um, let me invite uh, for presentation uh, Daria Pieczka and co-author David Abramowicz with presentation Spatial Policy and Social Cultural Activity as Drivers of Ecological Changes in the Organized River Catchment, example of the Yunikowski Stream Catchment, Poznań, Poland. Uh, Daria, we are see your presentation, so the floor is yours. Uh, subject of my speech is uh, special policy and social cultural activity as driver of ecological changes and urbanized catchment, example of Unikowski stream catchment Poznań in Poland. Uh, the research is aimed to identify the planet direction of special development and social cultural activities in Unikowski catchment. Uh, the Unikowski stream catchment is uh, located in Poznań. It's the fifth most populated city in Poland and is important element of uh, green infrastructure. Small fragments of this catchment are part of other communes. Uh, to this study, first we analyze the study of condition and direction of spatial development, a new project of this study. In my presentation, I will call it the study. Uh, in Poland, the, the study defines in a general way the special environment and local special uh, development rules. On the base, uh, communes elaborate uh, local special development plans. Uh, we analyze the 127 local special development plans from 1995 till 2022. Uh, local special development plans in Poland are documents that define the purpose of the area. Uh, for the anal analysis of the places that are not covered by uh, the local special development plans, we use the study. Uh, also, we use the cartographic presentation methods and overview uh, of social cultural event events to present, present the research results. Uh, the largest part of the catchment area is located uh, in uh, administrative borders of Poznań and small parts of other communes. It's Luboń, Komorniki, uh, Tarnowo Podgórne and Dopiewo. The total area of Unikowski stream catchment is almost 49 kilometers square and 31 of this is covered by valid local special development plans. It's, in total, it's 64% uh, of the catchment area. Uh, on their base, uh, base of local special development plans, the direction of special development for the study, uh, we divided into groups. It's a residential area, communication infrastructure, technical infrastructure, greenery and water, industrial and service area, and other forms of development uh, like uh, cementary and agricultural land. Uh, the dominance of residential buildings, including the single and, and uh, multi-family housing, is visible. Uh, taking into account the small areas of communes in Dopiewo, Komorniki, uh, Lubon and Tarnowo Podgórne, it can be con uh, cl concluded that residential development is dominant in here. Uh, in po the Poznań Commune has the largest area, and here the the intended use for residential uh, development is also the, the largest, but it should be noticed that the greenery and water is also uh, dominant here. But still, 35% uh, of this area is not covered by, uh, by the valid uh, local development plans. In this study, uh, the, the areas marked as a lack of special development plans are intended for residential development and roads. And uh, in the new, new project of the study, uh, consider uh, it as a priority to uh, prepare further local special development plans in order to make Poznan even a more environmental friendly city, uh, create convenient uh, transport, 
condition and conjuring and to live and develop uh, modern services. Uh, a significant part of green area and cultural objects accompany the organization of uh, social and cultural uh, events, which uh, are used by both, by uh, residents and tourists. Uh, these events are organized by communists, non-governmental organization and organization group uh, of residents. Among the places where such events take place, one should mention uh, Schachte, uh, Lasek Marcelinski, as well as uh, cultural facilities, uh, the most important of which are Tor Poznań and Mun Municipal Stadium in Poznań. <clears throat> Uh, investment in uh, recreational uh, development of green area also have a significant impact of uh, attractiveness uh, of the Unikowski stream catchment. Uh, these events, investments are uh, a, responsibility, a responsibility of the consuls and they play a special role, like uh, planning uh, the financial plans, uh, included the budget, and they try to make, take care of attractive the, the land development. Uh, for example, they prepare spending plans, allocate the funds for conversation, the green areas, while in previous years, funds were uh, allocated to investment for construction of, uh, for example, bicycle roads or uh, the small architecture. And now the conclusion of our study uh, the Unikowski stream catchment is area where the share of greeny and is comparable to area intended for residential and uh, industrial service development. At the same time, it's a very important place for recreation. Uh, considering that 35% uh, of Unikowski stream catchment area still has no uh, local special development plans and the processing urban pressure has a negative effect on the existing greenery. Uh, this is important to carry out uh, uh, the planning activities to regulate uh, future special development for which the uh, development plan has not been adopted yet. Uh, taking into account the growing interest for local, uh, local uh, population in green areas and their uh, recreational use, it is justified to undertake administrative action uh, aimed to existing uh, green area. And uh, uh, provision of the, the study and local special development plans take into account uh, such intended use of the area both in uh, Marcelinski, Lasek or uh, the Schachte. The limited way of further use of land uh, related to prohibition concert, concerning the function of uh, la ecological land will make it possible to reduce anthropogenic pressure, including the recre recreational pressure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daria, for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask and a question comment if your <coughs> audience have ones just to remind you that in any moment you can put your questions to any presenter in the chat and so Daria let me ask me uh, ask you because I wonder uh, what could be lesson learned for another areas so in uh, to what extent in which way your result can be use useful for other areas urban uh, river catchment in other cities for example they can be used like our methodology methodology uh, like like we use the first we analyze uh, all the local the plans and documents later the our cartographic methods uh, but the the results uh, <clears throat> can be used for other communes uh, uh, small communes near the big city like poznan and the other communes around um, yes, I can read this two ways. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me uh, invite uh, our last presenter, uh, Michał Jakel, with presentation uh, devoted to effectiveness of the buffer zone in the context of landscape changes and special planning case study selected national parks in Poland. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> My name is 
Michał Jakiel and I'm assistant professor at um, Institute of Geography and Spatial Management. I'm a geographer with a background of landscape ecology uh, and I'm interested in land use change, spatial planning and nature conservation issue. Mm, and I'm happy to, to present uh, today my mm, result of, of my research, uh, which are part of my uh, PhD thesis, uh, which I defend uh, in, 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 in last year in June. Uh, okay. Um, the topic is uh, about how effective is the buffer zone in the context of landscape uh, changes in uh, spatial planning and case of, of selected national park in, 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 in Poland. Uh, as most of you know, uh, um, the protected, uh, <clears throat> protected areas are the cor co uh, cornerstone of biodiversity cons uh, conservation. Uh, the surface um, area and number of protected areas has increased uh, significantly um, uh, over the past three decades. We have more and uh, more uh, protected areas. <clears throat> Uh, but at the same time, we observe a decline of biodiversity. Uh, this is mainly correlated uh, with uh, rapid intensive change of landscape, in particular uh, land use change, including, uh, especially including uh, intensive urbanization and uh, also landscape uh, fragmentation. Uh, each protected area is a part of a larger ecosystem. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, a basic concept of landscape ecology. Uh, land use change uh, <clears throat> around uh, protected areas may have negative uh, impact and isolate uh, national parks, but also others uh, protected areas from their um, surroundings and from the natural areas. Uh, so, uh, Surrounding lands are key for effective protection of an environmental and biodiversity. Uh, and the changes around protected areas uh, may affect on effectiveness of protected areas and may uh, result in a loss uh, of ecological connectivity. In order to uh, reduce uh, the external hazards such as, as deforestation, uh, housing development uh, on protected areas and reduce the edge effect around um, national parks and other protected areas, the buffer zone are created. The concept um, of buffer zone became widely known in, in, in uh, 1970 uh, when, um, when <clears throat> the program uh, men and biosphere uh, were introduced uh, as a part of, of, of UNESCO of, of UNESCO program. Uh, in Poland, the concept uh, the concept uh, of buffer zone were introduced in the beginning of uh, 1990s, uh, and the buffer zone are obligatory uh, for national parks and uh, also. Um, could be created around um, uh, <clears throat> landscape parks and uh, nature reserve. reserve. Uh, until today, uh, I couldn't find the research which has verified the effectiveness of buffer zone in Poland, <clears throat> but also uh, globally it's a real uh, research topic. So therefore, my main objective and 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 specific uh, objective include the, to determine the effectiveness of of of, of buffer of buffer um, zone for three selected national parks uh, in Poland and uh, specific objective determine the land use changes from 1920 to uh, 1960 based on the uh, analysis of historical topographic maps and area photographs to identify the spatial temporal changes in, 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 in um, the landscape structure, uh, fragmentation based on, on the landscape metrics, to evaluate spatial policy of selected uh, municipalities and uh, future land use change in the vicinity of selected national parks based uh, on analysis the, of spatial planning documents. Uh, I choose three national parks for my, for, for my research, located in different parts uh, of Poland, <clears throat> like you can see. 
Uh, national parks, uh, of course, is the most uh, important category of protected areas in Poland. <clears throat> uh, I choose for my research uh, Słowiński, Świętokrzyski and Ojcowski National Park. And uh, like I mentioned before, the buffer zone is obligatory for national parks. Uh, <clears throat> and what is important that spatial planning documents uh, within a buffer zone must be consulted with the park authorities. So, so it's very important for the uh, spatial planning issue. Uh, and uh, here uh, you can see the detailed uh, research pro procedure. Uh, the first uh, step was the selection of national park, uh, <clears throat> and the and also the collection of material materials uh, and and create the database. Uh, for the uh, historical changes, I use the cartogra cartographical ma ma materials such as topographic maps uh, and aerial photos uh, at a different scale, but mainly it was uh, uh, one two thousand five uh, thousand, uh, and also spatial planning documents. <clears throat> and some additional database. More details about the cartographic material, materials. Uh, <clears throat> I contacted the, my, my uh, analysis in the forum uh, time, time slots um, included in the studies. Here uh, we have a example of cartographic materials such as historical topographic maps and <clears throat> also um, orthophoto maps. And uh, below you can see land use maps as an effect of um, uh, vectorization, uh, this map uh, and the digitalization. The main aim of my study uh, was to find uh, out where changes uh, of land use uh, are taking, where occur these this, this changes. Uh, <clears throat> That's why uh, the analysis w um, uh, was carried out in, in different zone of level protection, like you can see on the um, uh, on this slide. It was the national park area buffer zone, and also concentric um, concentric buffers around uh, around um, national park, and also. Uh, rest area of uh, commune outside the buffer zone and the changes can be assessed compared to the uh, to the area uh, not covered by any legal uh, protection with others zone and some um, results the results uh, yeah, uh, the results um, the results uh, have indicated strong uh, dynamics of land use change in the three analyzed uh, national parks and their surroundings. <clears throat> uh, between uh, 30 to 38% areas, uh, areas uh, with any land use changes in the analyzed period uh, have been observed, like you can uh, see uh, here. Uh, so, and if we, <clears throat> If we go to for the details, the mm, biggest changes uh, were observed also in the concentric buffer zone close to the national parks, like uh, to up to uh, one and a half kilometers or around uh, around protected areas uh, up to um, half kilometers. <clears throat> and what is also interesting. <clears throat> If you compare the buffer zone and outside the buffer zone, we can see that the changes in the buffer zone, um, the, 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 there were um, biggest changes in the, in the buffer zone, inside the buffer zone. In this graph, uh, we have general land use changes from the last uh, <clears throat> 90, <clears throat> from last 90 years, divided by concentric buffers. Uh, if we look on the graph, we can see the uh, type of changes are quite similar for for the for for those um, parks. The main changes uh, that 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 we can say that three types of of the main changes uh, is increased forest cover, like you can see here. It's uh, <clears throat> uh, it's connected with uh, with uh, the secondary succession. Mm. 
and also um, land abundant, uh, and also grow the built-up areas and decrease uh, the decreasing surface of arable land, um, mainly transfer transformed in the built-up areas, grassland, and abundant areas. So the changes are uh, mainly related to abundant area um, land and secondary succession and also um, uh, housing development. And uh, maps with land use uh, chain uh, with land use uh, for ma uh, marginal uh, time slots, and you can see the changes uh, with with the marginal uh, periods. <clears throat> and the, 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 you, can, you can see the um, more forest cover and also like it's, see more to be built up areas uh, on this area. Um, here uh, you can see the maps presenting uh, increasing of the built up areas um, for the last 90 years around uh, these three selected national parks. Uh, orange color uh, uh, pre presenting uh, built up areas <coughs> in uh, 1930 and red color present uh, built up areas that have uh, appeared between, uh, between in, in analyzed uh, period. And here we have also graph, uh, and we can see the changes in the build up areas for different buffers, concentric buffers. Uh, the fastest and the biggest growth was observed in the <coughs> buffer zone located uh, near to the national parks. Like you can see uh, here, it's a uh, green and yellow, uh, yellow and 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 uh, th th this <coughs> two parts. <coughs> Uh, so um, the biggest changes uh, were observed up to uh, one uh, point kilometers. If we compare the areas uh, of the buffer zone, uh, of the buffer zone and areas beyond, uh, we we see that in the case of two parks uh, for Świętokrzyski and Słowiński, um, the built-up areas is uh, larger in the buffer zone. So we have also the um, fastest uh, growth. So if we compare these uh, two parks. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, quite uh, the same um, graph which present uh, changes, but uh, calculate uh, <coughs> in some uh, dynamic, uh, <coughs> uh, in some di uh, dynamic indicators. And also if we compare uh, the uh, parks in, and in some period there is a big changes in 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 um, areas close located to the close in the in this concentric buffer close to the national parks and uh, here we have uh, new development areas uh, uh, the, the distances of new development areas um, uh, have different distance from national parks uh, and here uh, like you can see that in some parks like Świętokrzyski and Słowiński, the new development areas occur mm, closer to the park uh, if we compare with others uh, uh, areas. And it's like you see, it's uh, also some differences in, in some periods. And uh, yeah, and uh, here we have some basic, um, <clears throat> basic uh, results about landscape structure changes based on uh, landscape metrics mm, and like you can see the patch density it's uh, grow up and also the mean patch size is um, um, decrease uh, of course it's uh, because we have more buildings small patches with, with buildings so so uh, that is the reason and of course the landscape is more fragmented in in this area uh, here is a uh, bra brave look at uh, what the Polish system uh, look like. Um, maybe I'll, I wish is, is, I, I skip this uh, because I think most of you know how how the Polish system looks like. Uh, of course, in my research, I um, use uh, um, documents from local level, the studies of condition, uh, di that direction, and also local special uh, development plans. And the biggest challenges in my uh, research was, was uh, to digitalize and create a um, spatial database from the uh, spatial documents. Here you have example of, of uh, municipality studies of direction around the Oitsovsky National Park. As a 
raster data before uh, digitalization. Um, I digitalized uh, more than 300 uh, local development plans and also uh, uh, for 18 communes, uh, the studies of direction. Uh, and the, um, the result about, uh, about the um, land use planning, on the map uh, you can see the current built up areas, uh, orange color, uh, and plant development areas according to the studies of condition and direction. It's a purple color. Um, according to the um, planning documents, the built-up areas may increase several times in, in, in some areas. The largest increase of the, uh, development areas uh, also um, concern uh, buffers located uh, also, also is close to the uh, uh, national parks. Um, if we compare, for example, if we compare the buffer zone and outside the buffer zone, the, the um, differences between buffer zone and outside the buffer zone, there, is, there, there are not, not uh, <clears throat> there are not too big uh, if we compare this. Uh, and the last slide with the result uh, and here we can see the visualization of area of development from the documents plannings and compare with uh, present land use so it's uh, um, a lot of areas with uh, new built up areas yeah general conclusion the study areas uh, the, the studies uh, sorry the studies show significant increase of built up areas and slightly increase of forest and the decrease arable lands uh, in the surrounding national parks. Um, the land use changes in the surroundings uh, of national parks are, are mainly connected with housing development, tourist infrastructure and abundance of arable lands. Uh, so uh, the, you can say the land use changes uh, are like uh, some polariz polarization. We have uh, in the one, one the hand we have uh, more forest area in on the second hand we have more uh, built up areas so it's it's a common um, <clears throat> it's a common situation in europe yes the main problem with uh, urban sprawl occur in areas located close to the big uh, cities like uh, krakow kielce because these parks to, to, uh, are located close to the big cities uh, local government plant two to large areas for development without considering the need of nature protection and the buffer zone and spatial planning policy are not effective uh, instruments for reducing the negative uh, human inf influence around national parks. For example, landscape uh, fragmentation and isolation. And of course, uh, the, the, the last conclusion is that there is need of, uh, of, of research focusing on land use planning assessment based on, on, on spatial planning documents around uh, protected uh, areas. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michal, uh, uh, for your presentation. Michal, uh, I'm very curious about uh, one issue, so let me ask you, because uh, the same uh, land use uh, doesn't mean the same for different national park. I, I mean that uh, our dif different national park protect very different uh, natural values. So the increase of arable land in buffer zone of one national park does uh, do uh, do not have some the same impact as in case of another one so i uh, so uh, i would like to ask about your opinion or uh, an urgent opinion if if uh, it's an option to in to to diverse the this the impact of land use changes depend of the individual national park and the subject of protection in in, in this park Mm, yes, uh, you are right. The, the, the some changes uh, could be, uh, mm, for example, if we have a mm, forest, uh, more for, forest cover in some areas, uh, mm, it could be a problem, for example, for some uh, some um, some species like uh, some uh, meadows where we have some special species. 
and for example on the on the, in my research uh, study uh, uh, it's um, upland uh, jurassic upland and the result of meadows uh, which are protected and the fo fo forest growth uh, more um, forest in these areas um, is a problem uh, but uh, i focus in my research on also in the um, built up areas uh, so of course the built up areas uh, have negative influence for the national parks because we have a um yeah we 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 lost a, a ecological uh, connectivity with uh, national parks and other areas um of course, in some areas uh, like in Slovinsky National Parks, uh, the also the the, the for I, I I I didn't say that uh, the forest grow is it's it's uh, better or not, but it's uh, my my result. For example, we have um, a lot of uh, meadows uh, around the um, uh, around the uh, Slovinsky National Parks and also in some areas inside the park, and uh, this is also. Uh, let's say protected uh, areas and we have protected species there and if we have more uh, forest uh, this uh, some of these uh, <clears throat> species can can not survive so so there is also some um, uh, some the, the, the park try to remove the secondary succession and so on so on so the, the, there is also some um, yes uh, try to uh, protected this this uh, this species yeah so thank you Michal, for your answer and then also thank you all pre uh, all uh, presenters and all participants for uh, taking uh, for uh, for attendance on our session and uh, so thank you and uh, inviting you for further conference events thank you and bye Yes, I would like to welcome all of you to participate in this section on migration. Um, we were interested in a session on migration between uh, Eastern European countries, but also with the rest of the world. And um, we had actually two submissions and a third paper was advised to our to our session so that we have at least three presentations and I do not want to take all the and steal the time and I suggest that we immediately start with the first one and I think it was by Brigitta, wasn't it? Good afternoon, uh, my name is Brigitta Nemeth and uh, I'm going to talk about our research with uh, Laszlo Lörins. Uh, we are both associates at, uh, of the ANET group at the Center for Economic and uh, Regional Studies in Budapest. And uh, Laszlo is also at the uh, Corvinus University of Budapest. Um, uh, and our paper is uh, how social capital is related to migration between communities. So, Besides uh, economic and uh, sociological uh, considerations, uh, social contacts are uh, important drivers of migration. In our research, our aim was to analyze how social uh, connections of uh, communities contribute to residential mobility and uh, to migration between uh, specific communities in Hungary. Uh, I would like to mention here uh, two recent studies. Um, which aim uh, similar uh, questions. Uh, first, uh, Blumenstock and his uh, co-authors used the uh, mobile phone uh, networks to analyze migration patterns in uh, Rwanda, uh, and they uh, examined the location choice of individuals and find that uh, having contacts at uh, the uh, destination area increases the likelihood of migration, and uh, if the individuals' network uh, connections are interconnected at these destinations, it also has a positive uh, impact. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the second one, uh, Büchel and uh, Associates analyze also, uh, residential mobility in Switzerland, uh, also using mobile phone data. 
and uh, they examine both uh, the decision on staying or uh, moving um, and the location choices and they find a significant uh, network effect in both cases. Uh, so, uh, how do social contacts influence one's uh, decision on migration? Uh, our acquaintances and friends can provide information about uh, cities, localities, and uh, learning about possible uh, destinations increases the probability that the potential migrants find an option that is attractive. Also, we can help each other with our friends and relatives by exchanging smaller, bigger uh, services, financial aid, uh, emotional uh, support and uh, companionship if, if we live uh, close to each other. So the influence of uh, social connections on migration um, originates uh, from the resources available by them and social capital alters uh, the cost benefits and risks um, associated uh, with uh, migration. Uh, okay, uh, the different network uh, configurations uh, provi provide uh, different utilities, uh, bridging positions provide information and uh, control benefits, uh, but uh, on the other hand, locally dense and closed uh, social structures has uh, the advantage of uh, preserving norms, uh, reciprocity and trust. Um, these aspects of uh, social capital uh, presumably influence migration in different ways. Uh, so we assess uh, local social capital, uh, which we measure by the intensity of connections within communities. Um, we also um, uh, uh, assess uh, bridging capital uh, by the intensity of connections between communities and uh, bonding uh, social capital, uh, what we think is uh, the extent to which local community networks exhibit uh, open or closed uh, structures. Mm. We analyze the impact of social capital on the community level. Uh, we think it's a property of uh, the local uh, uh, network uh, structure. Um, so individual uh, mechanisms uh, add up uh, to the community level in different ways. First, uh, if the local network of the community is dense, uh, because many locals have a high number of connections to each other, uh, that uh, restrains them from migration uh, and the migration rate will be lower. Uh, so we predict that social capital uh, originating from uh, relations to local individuals is negatively associated with the out-migration rate of a community. But uh, if many locals have a, have a high number of connections at other uh, locations, they can provide information on opportunities to them, uh, fostering their uh, migration. But uh, having these networks may not uh, only influence the behavior and the attitude of those having direct connections, but the information can spread uh, uh, over the local networks and may be utilized by different, uh, uh, by uh, indirect uh, contacts as well. So we uh, presume that uh, bridging uh, capital has a positive influence on migration uh, flows between uh, localities. Um, a further function of uh, social capital was uh, social control. Uh, which is a property of uh, tight community networks. Uh, local closeness on the dyadic level corresponds to relational embeddedness, uh, which is the chance that the uh, two parties have common, uh, common partners. So we believe this is more directly related to the social control over the behavior of the ego in the community. So we propose that the bonding social capital of, uh, of, the, uh, of communities is negatively correlated with the, their uh, out-migration rates. Okay, uh, uh, the data. Uh, we use uh, official data on the migration between Hungarian settlements uh, uh, from the uh, Central uh, Statistical Office. Uh, but we aggregated on a sub-region level. 
uh, we distinguish uh, 175 uh, local administrative units, so-called subregions, uh, with uh, 30,450 uh, potential connections between them. Um, the source of the social network data is the user and the network database of the EBIF. Uh, it was a very popular Hungarian uh, online social network site uh, before uh, Facebook uh, from 2002 until it was shut down in 2014. Uh, we used an aggregate version of the individual relationship database on subregion, subregion level. Um, and uh, okay, we have uh, some limitations here. So we have to be aware that uh, we are more likely to capture the impacts of weak ties uh, by using an OSN uh, because uh, it sets a relative, relatively low threshold for someone to be a member of the ego network. Also, uh, these uh, social networks include uh, uh, latent uh, ties, which are not active at the time just have the possibility to be converted to a weak tie. Um, okay, another uh, important set of uh, factors in migration are the available services and the economic characteristics of the source and destination areas. Uh, so we included uh, these in the analysis from the municipality level official database, also uh, from the central statistical office. Uh, and our uh, variables. Uh, 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 okay, we measured uh, local social capital by the sum of uh, connections within uh, the subregions. Um, the bridging social capital by the sum of connections between two different uh, subregions and the bonding social capital by the standardized uh, network uh, clustering coefficient of the subregions. It's, it's a, a global uh, uh, network clustering. Um, and uh, the most important non-network uh, related factors uh, are the subregion characteristics like uh, the demographic profile of the communities or uh, the economic opportunities and available services amenities at the source and destination subregions um, to describe uh, these properties we chose uh, uh, 25 and 25 uh, variables uh, when uh, selecting these we try to find a good example of the represented field, like uh, the number of uh, general uh, practitioners uh, describes the basic uh, public uh, healthcare. Then uh, we aggregated those um, and uh, then uh, standardized them for the population uh, and uh, we used the uh, lasso regression to select the relevant uh, controls uh, for our model. Uh, since we analyze point-to-point -point migration, um, a gravity model is a good choice, uh, as it can be uh, easily supplemented with the uh, push and pull factors. Um, and here we can see the estimate uh, equation uh, migration between ING subregions in 2014 on the left-hand side. Uh, on the right-hand side, the population of the source and destination subregions in 2013 and the distance uh, between the subregions. Um, uh, the social capital variables uh, that uh, we, uh, we would like to examine and, uh, and the controls. Uh, we have uh, observations for each pair of subregions, but uh, the observations for the local and the bonding uh, social capital indicators uh, refer to the subregion level. So, to avoid underestimating the standard errors, we use uh, clustered uh, uh, standard, er standard errors in the estimations by the source and the destination subregions. And uh, here we can see the results. In the four, uh, first uh, three models, uh, we measured the social capital variables individually. Um, the parameter of the local social capital is not uh, significant. Uh, the bridging capital coefficient is positive and significant. Uh, the bonding capital indicator is negative and significant. Uh, 
um, and in the third uh, model we entered all the social capital indicators at once and uh, uh, we lost the effect of the bonding uh, capital uh, and but in the fourth uh, uh, estimation uh, we can see that uh, this is mainly because um, the bonding and bridging uh, capital has uh, this uh, strong uh, interaction um, we believe this means that uh, for example if uh, if uh, there is a subregion with a high network clustering, uh, but the uh, region capital is also high, then that we can still expect uh, that we can still expect a uh, uh, high out migration. Um, as a robustness check, we estimated our models in a negative uh, binomial uh, form two, uh, which I'm not going to show now because of the time, but uh, we can see uh, any difference in the significance or in the direction of the coefficients uh, when uh, comparing. Uh, we examined uh, the relationship between domestic migration and the three social capital indicators created uh, from social network data in Hungary and uh, results uh, indicate that uh, more, pe more people move between places which are uh, better connected with uh, bridging social capital. Uh, the bonding capital uh, prevents out migration, but apparently the bridging capital can alter this uh, effect. Uh, also, we couldn't find uh, convincing evidence that uh, on the community level, uh, high local social capital would uh, restrain uh, migration. And uh, thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for uh, having me. Uh, Brigitta, it was very nice to have your presentation. Can you go please to slide nine to, to the regression results? Sure. Um, I, I do not really see the difference between model uh, one and two, except that you added two different measures for one for the local social capital, one for the bridging social capital, yeah? Yes. And, and when you go down to log distance, the, yes. the distance effect totally drops which basically means that the bridging capital covers the distance effect which is very Im important with this respect because then it doesn't really matter how far your new city pot potentially is as long as you have this bridging uh, social capital you do not uh, evaluate distance as a disadvantage anymore so strong yeah, uh, actually, we found this uh, in a, a former um, mm, uh, analysis. Yes, yes, <laughs> and we also have a nice uh, um, um, uh, picture about this effect. Uh, and it's actually true that uh, uh, if uh, if you have uh, connections uh, in a further uh, location. Um, it also, um, mm, there's a higher probability to uh, move there, so yeah. Yeah, and, and then I find it um, interesting that in the last two columns, four and five, also, yes. also here the effect of the bridging social capital becomes much smaller just when you, when you have the interaction e effect inside. So did you try to evaluate these interactions in more detail or because it's uh, a bit cumbersome? It's a pretty new um, uh, finding. Actually, I did, uh, we did this a uh, couple of days ago, for, uh, especially for this uh, uh, conference. And uh, uh, we didn't really give uh, uh, more thoughts, but uh, thank you. Uh, huh. It's huh. actually, uh, yeah seems uh, important yeah yeah and then if i got it right it is just um a cross-sectional survey yes you have no panel data uh yeah uh mostly because uh because of the osn uh the social network uh, we cannot uh, really use it uh, uh in a in a panel uh, uh 
uh, analysis because uh, because the um, the network uh, builds up uh, you know um, uh, first in the uh, big towns then smaller uh, towns and then villages so um, the rep um, representation is not good okay I mean, the, the other coefficients seem to be in the in the way we would expect, yeah. So yeah. With, with the population and so on, and I find it very very interesting. And we have another presentation by Martin, and Martin, you should be able now to share to do something. Um, and I suggest that I immediately stop talking and give the word to you, and you present it in the next minutes. So I'm going to uh, present uh, a paper I'm working on together with my supervisors Jan Fidermos and Nicola de Parsi on the impact of EU integration on development of uh, border cities. And I'm going to start out start by uh, this moderation. So uh, when, when you look at this uh, this image, you see uh, what, what looks like an ordinary square. It is a square located uh, north of north of uh, uh, Lille and but uh, when you look at the image uh, uh, below you see a line going through the square somewhere roughly around here and that is the border between uh, France and uh, Belgium dividing the city of Alloin and Menen. This is not something we are used to how uh, borders uh, look like look like this is this is uh, something how we imagine more that borders uh, look like this is the border uh, between uh, France and France and uh, Belgium say, uh, between the same cities Menen and Menen and uh, Alun uh, around 80 years earlier and and uh, we see this development when borders uh, when, when the uh, the old image of borders like this gets uh, change, uh, gets removed uh, all around the, all around Europe once a country exceeds the uh, the European Union. So in this in this paper, we want to look what uh, what how uh, the change from a border like this to a border like this has an impact on the municipalities surrounding the. Uh, surrounding the uh, border. Once a country accedes into the European Union, so uh, border uh, border uh, a border is a uh, is a barrier that impedes economic de development of a border region, as uh, it creates uh, uh, costs for. Uh, for for uh, firms to uh, to access part of uh, additional costs for firms who want to access part of their uh, markets, hence it is mo uh, more reasonable for firms to locate uh, more inwards into uh, within their own uh, country, and since uh, only a few firms remain, uh, there are less job opportunities. The, uh, hence also less people uh, also there and uh, um, bo uh, border regions even uh, in uh, border regions uh, are uh, peripheral within within their own country most of the time but when we, when we remove the uh, borders uh, in course of EU integration the borders can the border regions can revert their peripheral status as uh, Petrakos et al. here uh, here asked, this creates an opportunity, and it's uh, and uh, we want to look at if borders uh, have been turned from barriers to bridges connecting the two uh, sites or tunnels by passing them. Uh, and uh, we are not uh, so uh, we are not the first ones who look at this. There, there have been already several papers on this topic. And these papers compare the impact of EU enlargements on regions or cities located in the proximity, proximity of a border to other regions or cities 
in the uh, data set by means of difference in differences or uh, synthetic uh, control method. And uh, it seems it seems that uh, the border regions uh, benefit from uh, European uh, European integration. Though Brackman et al. note and Covea uh, et al. note that uh, it is still not enough to revert their uh, peripheral uh, status. But uh, notice that there are some uh, studies that have found uh, heterogene heterogeneous uh, results. And uh, that is because uh, besides looking at the general results, they have looked at uh, the impact on for individual borders. And as each, each uh, border is uh, uh, specific, uh, they have found that also the, uh, so, uh, somewhere the, uh, the results can be uh, insignificant and, and, uh, or, or, or even uh, negative. Now, uh, from all these studies, uh, only back on it, I'll have uh, have evaluated all the uh, EU enlargements, uh, but uh, they have only looked at the general results. So what we would like to do is similar to Brackman and I'll look at uh, all the previous or most of the previous EU enlargements, and uh, uh, but contribute by uh, by looking also uh, at the uh, at the uh, results by individual borders. So, uh, well, what we want to do is uh, is to look is to look if border municipalities benefit more from EU integration than uh, uh, other municipalities, uh, where where we eval by evaluating the all uh, all EU enlargements that took place before two thousand and eleven by taking into account heterogeneity across uh, the different enlargements as well as uh, in the heterogeneity across individual level of borders. To do that, we use uh, data from DG of uh, for regional and urban policy, who compiled uh, national uh, censuses on 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 the loud to municipal level for uh, every ten years since uh, uh, 1961, and we combine that with the spatial data from uh, GISCO to calculate uh, distances from municipalities to, uh, to uh, borders. And we use the population growth rate as a proxy for uh, economic uh, development. So this is how our uh, data, uh, data uh, looks like. Uh, we have six years with, so uh, since we look at growth rates, we have Five, uh, five periods. In the first, there was no enlargement. In the uh, second period, we have the Northwestern enlargement with Denmark, Ireland, and the UK. In the third year, we have uh, uh, the enlargement of uh, uh, Greece, uh, Spain, the southern to Spain, Portugal, and uh, Eastern Germany, uh, Eastern, and, and Eastern Germany, uh, during the uh, German unification process. But since Greece doesn't border uh, any previous uh, EU member state, we do not uh, 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 we do not look at the accession of Greece in, in this year. And then in the last two periods, we have the neutral free, Austria, Finland, and uh, Sweden, and the Eastern Eastern eight and uh, Eastern two enlargements, where again uh, Cyprus and uh, um, we do not consider Cyprus and Malta as they do not share with as the island countries they do not share borders with any other uh, EU member state. So we uh, we evaluate uh, uh, this by the means of uh, differences in differences with uh, spatial. Uh, spatial uh, discontinuity, where our dependent variable is the population growth of municipalities. In the treatment group, we have municipalities near borders affected by the progress of uh, uh, EU integration on both sides of the border. And in the control group, we have in uh, all other municipalities. So these are uh, 
municipalities located further away from the border or municipalities located near borders not affected by uh, EU uh, integration. We, we also use different, uh, uh, different uh, cutoffs uh, from the border to check for uh, consistency. And what we do is that, uh, as noted here, we lo look uh, on the impact for, uh, on the level of, uh, so, so for several, uh, for uh, several, for the, for the enlargement, uh, enlargement groups. But also we, we also look at the general impact of uh, all enlargements, as well as uh, uh, we look at the, on the level of individual borders and uh, we also categorize the municipalities by population size. So this is uh, how our uh, how our uh, how our treated uh, uh, treated municipalities uh, the treated group looks like. We have the municipalities located within near border within several uh, uh, thresholds, and overall they are around uh, twenty three thousand. Uh, municipalities located uh, near borders that are affected by e uh, the EU enlargements we look at, uh, which which is uh, uh, less than one third of uh, our uh, overall uh, overall sample. Now, if we look at the general results of EU enlargements, we see that in uh, general the uh, border regions benefited from uh, uh, from EU. The border municipalities benefited from EU uh, enlargement, but it was still uh, not enough to uh, to revert their uh, peripheral uh, status as the uh, as the overall effect of being a border municipality is still uh, is still larger in magnitude and uh, negative and we see also consistency for uh, for for several distance uh, uh, cutoffs now when we look at uh, uh, when, when, when we distinguish the enlargement groups we see that uh, consistently only the municipalities near the uh, border uh, borders of the southern two enlargements, so enlargement of Portugal and Spain, uh, consistently benefited from the EU accession of Portugal and uh, Sp uh, Portugal and Spain. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, we have uh, we have municipalities uh, near the borders of uh, 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 of the neutral free enlargements of Austria, Finland and uh, uh, Sweden that have experienced a uh, decline of uh, population population growth or rather the decline of population growth after the uh, after their EU accession and same holds for uh, the uh, eastern two the, the eastern two enlargements of is enlargement of Bulgaria and uh, Romania when we look at uh, the results based on uh, quanti city, city, uh, municipality size uh, quantiles, we see that for the uh, for the neutral free and eastern two enlargements, the negative impact is uh, driven more by uh, smaller sized uh, municipalities, whereas the opposite holds for the Eastern, uh, the Eastern Eight uh, municipalities uh, near the borders of the Eastern Eight enlargement, or the Biden, near the borders of the Biden Eastern Eight enlargement. While for the others, there's not really a significant uh, difference. Now, when, when we look at the individual borders, we have here a pretty large heterogeneity. So the largest impact was. Uh, uh, the largest positive in, uh, positive impact is for the municipalities located uh, near the Austrian-Slovak border, affected by the Eastern Eight enlargement, 
And this is also a border that's quite specific as there are, uh, as there are two, main, two capital cities, one on each side that are near this, uh, near this border. So th this can be, it can be driven by uh, this fact. Otherwise, uh, we have also positive, uh, positive impact for the uh, municipalities located near the UK uh, border with Ireland. And uh, also, as seen previously, the, uh, the sovereign two enlargements of uh, uh, Spain and Portugal, Spain and uh, uh, France. While on the other hand, we have uh, negative impact for Bulgaria and uh, uh, Greece, and as well as the, between the Baltic states. Now, uh, the, uh, the heterogeneity in, uh, here could be driven by, uh, by a, a lot of factors, driven uh, let's, uh, by, by language, language or cultural proximity, or by, uh, by, geogra by geographic barriers. So, so the next step here could be to see, uh, to, to see exactly what factors influence uh, this heterogeneity. So just to, uh, to sum up, uh, in this paper we try we evaluate the impact of EU enlargement on population growth on municipal level using data that enabled us to evaluate the impact of EU enlargements that happened before 2011. Our results support the previous findings that the accession into the EU is not enough to reverse the pers the peripheral status of the border regions. In fact, we find that the only municipalities near the borders that were integrated into the EU as part of, uh, as part of the 1986 enlargement consist consistently benefited from the enlargement. On the uh, individual level, we have quite large heterogeneity as uh, besides municipalities near the 1986 enlargement, uh, all the, on the ones near the UK Ireland border and Slovak Austrian borders experience an, uh, a significant increase in population after their integration into the EU. While on the other side we have the uh, we have the municipalities of the uh, of the uh, borders of the Baltic countries and Bulgaria that have declined. The next step could be to uh, evaluate the factors driving this heterogeneity. Yeah. Thank you, Marty. This was a very nice presentation. Um, also showing maps, which we as regional scientists always like. Are there any questions from the uh, audience? Uh, as heterogeneity, as maybe maybe I'm phrasing this wrong, but as heterogeneity, I understand that uh, you have uh, you have uh, Quite different, uh, a lot of differences between uh, between the uh, between the results. So, uh, uh, so for instance, uh, uh, here when they find uh, here in, in, in the beginning, when I have here that there were heterogeneous results, is that for, uh, is that the what the what the authors found that uh, the uh, municipalities or the, the German municipalities ne located near the border with uh, Poland benefited more from EU enlargements than uh, those uh, located near the border with uh, with uh, with Czechia. Uh, and so, uh, what what uh, we want to uh, so uh, yeah, trying to take uh, take. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, the, 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 the differences, yeah, um, maybe I phrased it wrong. Ah, now there is a question. Why do you, from Tomasz, why do you measure the impact on population growth? In many border towns, especially in Polish German or Polish Czech, we have a population decline. Yes, yeah, so uh, on one hand, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, the argument. Uh, this is uh, this is the only only data we have that go uh, that uh, that uh, that far, and also uh, I 
don't think uh, I didn't have that at time to uh, show it here, but basically it, it relies on a paper by, by Redding and Sturm who create also a theoretical model that argues uh, that, that, uh, uh, that the uh, population growth of, uh, uh, of uh, cities can be a proxy for uh, economic, uh, economic growth. We are aware of uh, uh, that it is not perfect. So we are also thinking uh, thinking about uh, using uh, uh, nightlight uh, uh, data as as a um, maybe as a better uh, dependent variable of uh, economic uh, development. But that's the, uh, we are still in early stages with that. So I wasn't so I wasn't able to show uh, the results uh, results uh, with that. So I hope uh, that uh, answers your question. But yes, we are fully aware of uh, of the uh, of the uh, ne negative of the uh, downsides of using population growth and. Uh, it's something we are dealing with right now. Um, thank you, Martin. If there are no other questions, I have one as well. Mm -hmm. and the first one uh, relates, I mean, you have shown us the maps which uh, borders you consider, but uh, for instance, Ireland and UK have, um, they have the common border, but there are also port cities. And when the uh, UK enters the U European Union, the ports may become even more important than before. So maybe just as an idea for a next step, if there are next steps to do, um, to, to focus also on the, on the border regions, uh, on the sea border regions and to see whether there was an impact. Uh, this is more a comment and then my question goes especially also to, to the direction what Tomas asked about, about the Eastern European countries, where if I got your, under, uh, your results right, had the feeling that they have more or less lost population. And here I'm wondering whether the integration process of these regions uh, is slightly differently in the sense that the the core cities, like in Poland, Warsaw, or bigger cities, were the drivers for the European integration process. They were where foreign investors entered, and therefore we had, after the, the joining the EU, two, two flow, migration flows, migration flows from the border regions to the centers, or from any region within, say, Poland to the centers, but also to other countries and especially border regions were poorer in the past. And once you got the chance to leave mm -hmm. the border region, you, you may enter another country or from a Romanian perspective, or you go to, to Bucharest, for instance. So, so that you have now options for migration flows that were in, or that, that increase the disadvantage of being in the border regions. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the uh, for the comment. First, uh, uh, I'll try to first regard the 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 to answer the question. Um, yes, this is this is one uh, one uh, aspect of the of the especially of the uh, last enlargement of Romania Bulgaria that uh, is not uh, captured in this, in this simple model. So we are also trying to think how, uh, how to, uh, how to, uh, how to, how to capture this. Um, if, and that's probably, uh, that's probably the, also, also the, uh, one of the, the uh, most negative aspects of using the population growth that uh, you have, you, you uh, the, uh, the, this might have played more of a role than uh, than 
uh, than other things. So th th that's why we are looking also now at the, at the nightlight data. But but uh, what, what theoretically what could be done here is to look at some agglomeration effects uh, in the in the uh, in the new member states, at least to capture some of the things. Uh, let's uh, as uh, uh, as these countries have have uh, have experienced also quite uh, a significant level of divergence in comparison to other countries uh, you bond their uh, EU enlargement. So yeah, that that could be one thing. Uh, but regarding the what migration, we don't have a solution yet. Regarding the Boards, uh, how would you suggest you measure that uh, with pure, uh, pure uh, air distance or? Uh... Well, you can indicate a municipality, say Dover. Now everyone knows Dover. Ah, yes. so, so we uh, just to to enter Dover as a municipality, yes. and and it gets a dummy for being one a port city, and then you add the. It's a dummy for being a port. And if you have plenty of ports, they are a border region or a, yeah, they are a border city. Uh, usually, if you don't have a port, you cannot leave this area. Yes. So you have no impact. But once you have a port, you are allowed, so to say, to enter other countries from this area. My, uh, but, I never thought about it in more detail, but this might potentially work. Yes, uh, yes, we, we we will look look more into that. Mm. Thanks. Mm. Uh, I have one more point. Yes, maybe EU funding and border regions. The the last programs were more on on EU funding for border regions and peripheral regions. Mm -hmm. Maybe this would help as well to, to think whether it can be incorporated. So to uh, to also uh, also incorporate the the the, the, fun, the the intensity of funds that a region uh, yeah. or a region cut. Yeah, for instance, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I have also no more comments or notes on you, but it was a nice presentation. I would like to thank you. And thank, thank you very much for the attention and for the for the comments uh, comments uh, from you as well as from uh, from Tomas and uh, Katarzyna. Katarzyna, yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you so much. And then we can go to the last presentation, which will be my presentation. And now I'm a bit. This is an older version, and I would like to present joint work together with Katarzyna Mischal. Mischak and Alexandra Vrona, who both work for the uh, Univers Wroclaw University of Economic and Business, or University of Wroclaw for Economic and Business, and not Wroclaw University. Please apologize this uh, mistake here. Um, this joint work um, focuses on, on the German labor market, and especially in Germany, we have the expected population decline and we, we are oh, parts in Germany of the economy say that, uh, claim that we have labor shortages and in so far um, we need some immigrants from other countries to fill up our workforce. And so from a German perspective, Immigration is required to, to um, avoid the negative or to reduce the negative impact of a potential uh, population decline and associated with labor shortages. So we were thinking about, okay, which kind of immigration group is very important for Germany. And usually one thinks of people from Turkey or from Italy, which which emigrated from these countries and other countries as well to Germany uh, in the history and built uh, very strong um, immigration communities. On the other hand, we have a very long standing emigration, but also immigration history uh, 
common history together with Poland, which was not so often thought about. And so we were especially interested in the Polish employees which work in Germany and whether they work in jobs and so that they really add to our labor market, to which extent they add to the labor market. And then we have on the other hand, the, the better situation in Poland now because of lower unemployment rates now and also uh, wage growth in the last 20 years. Uh, so that the Polish labor market has improved. And when the Polish labor market has improved, of course, to be in Germany with another language is not so, um, well, how to say, uh, not so nice. <laughs> I, I have not the right word now. Not so nice to stay in Germany because if you can go back to home, then it might be nicer for you as well. And therefore we ask whether Germany is still attractive for Polish workers. And we basically consider the employment structure as a first try here of Polish individuals in Germany. Um, this is a very first, uh, well, analysis where especially I had to focus on the German side data and the data we use here for the program uh, is from, from the Institute of Employment Research. And here we observe the so-called integrated employment biographies by all people in Germany working subject social security contributions or to be unemployed. So we consider only individuals who work subject social security contributions and for, for our project here, it is important to understand and to recognize that we do not consider self-employment and we cannot consider, uh, for instance, Polish workers with a Polish company working in Germany in say, uh, pre-justice in the construction sector. So this is what we do not observe. We only observe people, individuals who work full time as Polish, uh, with a Polish background, uh, subject social security contributions. So on the basis of the entire employment history of all workers, we can also construct measures on the labor market performance on the individuals, uh, which is a big advantage of this data source. As I said, we only consider full-time employees because the working hours are not recognized with this databases and we would have a high bias if we consider um, uh, part-time employees. In total, uh, the sample is drawn from the whole universe of all employees within Germany and we consider a 10% sample of four time periods starting in 2002, uh, 2000 and then 2006, 12 and 18. And we consider real wages, uh, which takes out a bit the between region variation uh, in 2018. And then we deflated it all. Yeah. When we first focus on the Polish migration flows, you can see in these figures two graphs. Uh, the one is the emigration from Poland and the other one is the immigration to Poland. And there you can realize a blue line. I'm not sure whether you can see now what I show. Here is a blue line indicating the emigration flow from Poland to Germany. We had basically a steady flow from Polish individuals to Germany. Then we had the financial crisis here in 2014, 2015, 2016. It drops, uh, no, 2008, 2009. Here it drops and then it goes back. And now after uh, it is a bit uh, lower since 2016. But still the time before we have very high migration flows. When the uh, Poland entered the labor market, the European labor market, here we have the peak of the UK where many Polish people emigrated to, uh, to the UK. If we focus on the immigration structure, again, here this this blue line shows Germany 
And again, we have a VTAL exchange, but according to these figures, less individuals migrate from Germany to, to Poland than uh, we observed the other direction. Okay, so what I would like to say, Germany is one of the, or is the biggest uh, emigration country from Poland perspective. Uh, there is also the United Kingdom to be mentioned and the other countries, there are flows, but they are not so pronounced. Now we come to our sample and here on the upper left figure, we see the blue uh, bars, which are the amount of Polish employees in our sample. The, we start in 2000 with less than 10,000 uh, Polish workers and we end up in 2018 with more than seven times higher values, more than 60,000 Polish workers uh, are employed in Germany in our sample. This is a 10% sample, so we can say about 600, 700,000 indi Polish individuals work and provide the work capacity in Germany in full-time employment, which means that they have a very high impact on the German labor market indeed. And of course now, please excuse me, but we have some pre-justice uh, about Polish workers in Germany. And one pre-justice relates to the Polish workers are usually workers which work in farming occupations. So I would expect that many uh, workers from Poland work in peripheral regions, but at the end, the distribution between German employees over the regional types to be in a very large city, in a more dense area or a peripheral area are more or less comparable. So my pre-justice on all the Polish workers work in agriculture cannot be uh, recognized when we focus on the distribution in with respect to the regions. Focusing on the age structure shows a very typical uh, picture. The majority of the Polish individuals is younger compared to the Germans. On average, immigrants from Poland working in Germany are on average younger. We see here a slight increase also of individuals working uh, of an age of 55 and older here in Germany, but this can also be um, just driven because immigrants become older and because of the long history now these old immigrants, so to say, when they entered here, they are 20 years older and so they move up and therefore I think we have ob observed therefore this shift here in the age structure. Interestingly, the, the gender mix is not very different. We have about 65% of German males and then about 35 uh, females employed. Here is a slight increase and the same we can observe for the Polish employees. Here we have a, in 2018 a slightly higher value of male employees. So there is a slight increase, but it is not so different to the German pattern. Now it becomes more interesting, I would say, if you focus on the qualification structure, which is on the left panel. This is a German qualification structure. Blue means uh, no vocational training information given. Yellow means that this, um, this information is not provided, even after we made some correction, which are uh, suggested for this kind of databases. If we focus on the, on the Polish worker side, more, relatively more workers have no vocational training degree relative to the Germans. And this increase, uh, no, it, it has decreased uh, in the future after the EU enlargement, enlargement in 2011, 2012, when the German labor market was fully open for Polish employees. But anyway, we have this dramatic increase in non-response for this question. And therefore, we cannot really say, okay, here the qualification structure is this and that, 
of the Polish employees in Germany, because we do not know whether they are high skilled, whether they are unskilled, or whether they hold a university degree or vocational training degree. This is what we cannot judge, but the amount is massive. And therefore, I separate it also by tasks. The tasks performed at the job, according to the theory by author, we have unskilled tasks where you do not need specific knowledge on the job. You have skilled tasks where you usually request a vocational training degree. And then we have specialists or experts, I put it together in one group, um, tasks which usually request an academic degree. And if you see these figures here, we can see about half of the Polish employees in 2018 had performing unskilled tasks, which was really surprising for me. An interesting thing is when you focus on the proportion of being unemployed, we realized that the Polish employees are almost always in employment. So, which means that they are never unemployed and with respect to content that they uh, account for the social security contributions, they more or less pay into the German pension schemes and social security schemes and they are never unemployed or rather seldom unemployed relative to the Germans. So, it is indeed beneficial for from a German side to have these Polish workers here. Also, they work mainly in unskilled tasks. In this figure, uh, I compare wages and these Polish uh, wages as the emigration and immigration data uh, comes from Statistical Office of Poland. And here we only had uh, information of the age structure and their salaries in Poland. This is for October 2018 and it was only accounted uh, and measured in Polish Sloty. So I translated it with the average um, exchange rate to Euro so that we have a picture what uh, we can earn in Poland in Euro in 2018. Um, here on the X axis, there are uh, different occupations. And here we see the average wage uh, in depending on the age structure. And we see here are occupations where you earn less than 1000 euro per month. It increases then in other occupations and goes up to 1500 or say here to 2000 uh, euro per month. And these are the numbers on average Polish workers earn in Poland. Few, only few, um, occupations have higher wages. The right panel, uh, <laughs> it is not very harmonized so far, uh, depicts wages in Germany separated by male and female, sorted by female, therefore is so nice here. And this is also an approximate uh, for the monthly gross income, so without taxes. So it, it, it still is a gross income. And it ranges for most of the occupations. It starts with 1,700, 1,800 euro, and it goes up. It exceeds here for females at least 2,000 euro and increases up to 4,000 euro. In other words, having in Poland on average wages below 2,000 euro and in Germany usually over 2,000 euro it might be beneficial to migrate uh, and to work in Germany. And the same is true if we focus on the, on the male side. So we indeed see that, um, that there is a wage gap, so that the incentives to work possibly in Germany are still given. Now comes a figure which I didn't know whether it is nice or bad to present. On the left-hand side, I present you and I show you the occupational mix. Again, back to my German pre-justice, um, we have again here the occupations and the lighter, and, and I just sum up the number of workers within these occupations. And 
here we have two uh, bars for, for Germany for 2012 and 2018, and here for 2012, 2018. And these are the relative proportions within occupations. The darker one occupation is, the higher the occupational number is. It is not sorted by anything. So this means if the color of this bar in 2018 for the Polish employees is differently to the bar of the Germans in 2018, we can identify a different occupational structure here by with, with our eyes. Okay, And indeed, we see here the first occupations are much more frequently chosen by Polish workers and the latter the, with, so to say, higher numbers are rather seldom compared to our German workers. Um, on the right hand side, we have the relative wages again, the what earns a Polish uh, employee relative to a German employee. And we have here on average, uh, they earn less. There are only few occupations where Polish uh, females earn more. And here for the male side, usually Polish males earn less relative to German males in Germany within these occupations. So we ask, okay, how can we explain this pay gap of about 70%? And what we have done is a stepwise regression on the pay gap. So the, the left-hand side variable is it's the individual wage and uh, a worker uh, earns separated by, uh, yeah, just the average cross daily income. And if I just run a regression on daily income and add only one characteristic, namely uh, to be a, a Polish worker, then the dummy for the Polish worker accounts for 65% of the income Germans can achieve. And now we simply add uh, other characteristics and to identify how the pay gap will be reduced. So if I add industries that Polish and uh, German workers may work in different industries, the pay cap uh, reduces to 81%. So on average, once we control for industry, uh, the pay gap between Polish and German workers is just 81%. Interestingly, and this is a bit what we have seen before on the figure, if I add information on the occupations where the workers uh, work in, the pay gap reduces, but not to such a uh, big amount. Of course, if I change here the order, the numbers will change. If I add the task content, the pay gap, so industry fixed effects, occupation fixed effects, task fixed effects, the pay gap still accounts for 90%. So Polish workers earn 90%, 10% are, or less than 10% are unexplained. If I add the regional information, nothing really changes. If I add age and gender distribution, nothing really changes. Now, if I add the labor market performance, the pay gap almost uh, becomes neglectable. And if I add firm characteristics, the pay gap accounts for 0.8% in difference, differences in real wages. So given, uh, a number what 0.8% mean, and uh, a pay gap of 0.8% amounts for a monthly difference in gross income of 24 euros, which is, so to say, not really pronounced from my perspective. Then we ask, okay, which variables, which characteristics uh, affect the wages? And just to show you briefly, uh, we have here the skilled tasks relative to unskilled tasks, wages will increase. If you work as a specialist or expert, wages will increase. If you work in the urbanized or peripheral regions relative to the agglomeration region, wages will decrease. We find also an, uh, an age structure, which is inverted U-shaped um, with a maximum between 35, 44 um, females earn on average, less than males. And now if we focus on the employment side, 
the lo just to to say it roughly, the longer you have been unemployed, the lower is your wage um, relative to others. Then we have some measures in for the duration in the current firm, the average duration within firms as a measure to, to measure how much uh, you collected uh, human capital in different firms. And we indeed find positive effects here. And the right panel considers firm characteristics only. And here we can clearly see that if you work in larger firms, your wages are higher. And if the proportion of human capital in firms is higher, uh, meaning that there is a higher fraction of specialists and experts employed, then wages are also higher. And now we find here this uh, very small effect for the Polish employees. This is a dummy which accounts for this 24 euros. Okay, we went then beyond and performed also Oxaka blinder decomposition, but this is very, very roughly spoken. We find here a pay gap of, of about 37.8%. And from this, we can explain 27% by endowments. So this is just that Polish workers work in different industries, occupation, tasks, and so on. And we find no uh, strong overall effect for the difference in coefficients. However, if you go into detail, what is uh, then the big um, part here, uh, shows that we still have differences in coefficients, but positive and negative coefficients rule out each, each other, so that the overall coefficient effect becomes negligible. When we focus on the endowments, the, the question always is, if I adjust the Polish workers uh, on the average industry mix to the industry mix of the German workers, their wage will increase by 9%. If I adjust the occupational structure, the wage will, of Polish workers will increase by 1.5%. As we have seen, most of or half of the Polish workers work in unskilled tasks. If I adjust the tasks to, to more skilled uh, labor, the wages will increase by 7.5% indeed, a high value. The labor market experience also uh, Polish workers have less labor market experience in Germany. Their wage will increase by 14%. And obviously, we find also that the firm characteristics between Polish and German workers seem to differ in, in spite that the Polish workers work in less productive firms. If I adjust here to the values of the German, the wages will rise by 4.8%. The coefficient effects are usually smaller um, I do not want to go into detail here so much, but interestingly, we have seen that the labor market experience is uh, in favor, so to say, of the Polish workers in a sense that they are less frequent unemployed and therefore here to be unemployed as a Polish worker is not really dramatically seen by, by German employers. The constant term here relates to differences which we cannot explain. So the Polish workers just enter uh, with lower wages. And so I will conclude. Uh, the Polish workers are an important group at the German labor market. Interestingly, and what surprised me indeed, is that 50% work in unskilled tasks. This is what I didn't expect. Um, when we control for other characteristics, the adjusted pay gap becomes, from my perspective, rather small with about 24 euro per month in gross income. Um, but however, we, we find evidence that uh, the differences in income are driven by differences in endowments, but also in coefficients. And because the coefficients relate to different employment schemes, uh, there might be some kind of, so to say, discrimination but this is what we will have to adjust in the near future. And so I would like to thank you. And I'm now open for questions. Obviously not yet. So our idea now is to, to focus more in detail what is the Polish side to see whether we can confirm that they work more on unskilled tasks. What is the reason behind? And we want to go more into detail there.
And then, of course, we need to, to look to the literature. This is the first attempt to find which music, so to say, is in our data and whether it makes sense to continue that work. Any questions? Thomas? Yes, I have, I have two questions. Uh, Stefan, you showed us uh, results of your regression analysis. And uh, I observed that there is no, okay, uh, you have a negative, oh yeah, you have negative impact in agglomeration region, urbanized region, and peripheral region. Yeah. Um, do you have any idea how to explain this, this negative impacts? Because, okay, we, we could expect that at least in agglomeration region or urbanized region, it will be a positive impact. Mm. Yeah. my opinion and the reference the reference is being in an agglomerated region so because the majority about 50 percent of uh, our workforce about almost 50 percent work in agglomeration region therefore i have chosen it as a reference group and so the wages in urbanized regions are 0 0.05 for uh log wages lower when you are employed for German or Polish worker in urbanized regions and about 0 0.1 log wages are lower in peripheral regions. This is, okay. I would say, just a wage premium you earn in, in agglomerated regions. So say in Warsaw, in Warsaw, wages are higher compared to Karpacz. So this is what these results state. If I choose the peripheral region as a reference, then the urbanized region will have an impact of plus 0 0.05 and the agglomeration will have then a plus 10, uh, a 0 0.10 uh, value. So this is just uh, that the wages are on average higher in agglomeration regions. We cannot say why, but they are just higher there. Conditional on all the other uh, aspects. So this is an agglomeration force, I would say. Oh, so, okay. And I, I have the second question. Um, do you observe any trend in, um, okay, is uh, this uh, share of Polish workers working in un un unskilled uh, tasks? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. uh, 50% seems to be quite large number. Uh, yeah. Do you observe any decline or? It, there was a slight decline between 2012 and 2018. Um, do you see the cursor here moving? Uh, okay. Yeah, so there was a slight decrease in, uh, but still with 50% quite high. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why really yeah, um it, it was amazing for me yeah because we have a really large difference between 2006 and 2012 yeah six years and ah uh, yeah ah uh, this there we have to be careful uh the information on skilled unskilled and specialist experts is recognized with the classification of occupation since 2010 and our the, the IAB uh, they have some procedure to go with this with uh, some classification schemes into the past. So I wouldn't say that these are necessarily um, reliable information. So yeah. to say, on the unskilled measure. So, but but possibly we will have to take it into account when we do our estimation because this may drive our results mm. so that we cannot use the information prior 2012. okay stefano thank you very much for your presentation it's uh you did a great job uh, with many data and uh, results are really detailed so uh yeah. just i like it yeah thank you i hope it will be published soon uh, no soon definitely not ah, we, okay. uh, which which was my fault that we are not much further but anyway yeah i would like to thank you thomas for organizing the conference as well 
when you're once here and yeah. also which which is especially when you organize it uh, online still an additional other different challenging task i hope we will meet in poznan or maybe in schwerin at some other time in the year yeah. next years or during elsa congress who knows uh, yeah 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 in two years <laughs> okay and uh, i think now we can also close the session i would also thank the other two presenters to being here to share their ideas here and if you don't mind i stay here to discuss a bit with katarzyna mischak and i hope i pronounce her right and otherwise i would like to wish you a nice evening and a nice remaining congress tomorrow and on wednesday <laughs>